I was pretty new when this happened, but it appeared that Stragview would be educating me early in its ways. I had a background as a secretary, and my bachelor's in cybersecurity probably hadn't hurt my placement in the control room one bit. Telling people that you work in the control room makes it sound a lot grander than it is. It really is the nerve center for the prison, but that really just translates to hurting cats all night. You keep track of counts, you watch the cameras for the whole prison, you roll the gates that get people into the places they probably shouldn't be, and you run the checks that help keep this place running. You work a very important post. That's not up for negotiation. And it can be kind of a lot sometimes. That night was one of those nights. It had been a pretty smooth night up until that point. Counts had gone through like butter. The fence checks and building checks were done before 11, and the rabbit run had been canceled that night since a light rain had started about 10.30. It was beginning to work its way into the golden time, the time between 11 o'clock count and chow time when you can just relax and watch a little YouTube. I was sitting there with Officer Keller, a newbie who had only been there about a week, and we had just started making plans to see what was on Spotify when the call came in from Post Vehicle 2. Stragview has four post vehicles, each of them keeping watch over a mile and a half stretch of fence. We usually put older officers out there, officers on light duty, officers who don't seem to be a good fit for the dorm, but don't really have a knack for the control room either. Or sometimes officers on disciplinary suspension or on no inmate contact. For that reason, we don't get a lot of sharp tacks out there, but when Coggins called me to let me know that something strange was going on near the north perimeter of the woods, I sighed and picked up the mic. It had only been a matter of time before the solid matter hit the oscillating apparatus. Say again, Post 2, I said, picking up the radio. I said there's someone out here by the tree line. That wasn't an uncommon event. Not as uncommon as you might think. The woods around Stragview were mostly marshland, probably why the prison had gotten so much of it. But people did sometimes bumble into it and then come out by the fence line. The last one had been a scared hiker who needed to go to Kashmir Medical after nearly getting himself shot by a perimeter guard. The time before that had been an inmate who'd fallen into the old mine tunnels beneath the tower. Before that, I heard, it was an inmate who had escaped. He came back alone, two others having fled with him, and they said he seemed pretty happy to be back. Now what appeared, we had a mysterious figure on the perimeter. Go to channel two, I said, not wanting to clog up the primary channel. I clicked over to two, right along with about a dozen others, I'm sure, and I waited for the tone that told me that he had swapped over. Can you identify the person? Is it a hiker or is it an inmate? Silence. Silence. Then, he looks like he's in uniform, but it's not our current one. Scrunched up my face. What do you mean? What I mean is he's wearing the brown uniform pants that we traded for the black BDUs we wear now. No one's worn those pants in a decade, at least. That was different. Could be someone trying to take advantage of our revolving door of staff to make their way onto the compound but apparently they had gotten hold of an old uniform. I wasn't sure why anyone would want to sneak onto the compound. There was no chance I was going to let them take an inmate through the gate if they were running an escape attempt, but I suppose it was a problem we were going to have to deal with. Have you spoken with him? Nope, Coggins says. I've called to him, but he won't approach my vehicle. What's he doing? I asked, Keller flipping through the cameras of the Post 2 area to try to find an angle on the intruder. We could see Coggins, his truck parked in the road as he shone his spotlight at the woods, but I didn't see anyone standing there on the old CCTV monitor that we seemed to be stuck with. He's just standing there, looking into the woods, and there was a sharp yell, and it sounded like Coggins spat out a handful of the words that he would probably get a write-up for for saying on an open mic. Given the circumstances, we could probably give him a pass, though. Coggins! Coggins! What's going on? The radio was silent for about ten seconds before I tried again. Coggins, report! Do you need assistance? Silence. Silence. 
Just as I was preparing to call the captain so I could get the police out here, Coggins came back with a loud crackle of static. Sorry, Control, I dropped the radio. There's two more now, and one of them is definitely an inmate. When the phone started ringing from the captain's office, I realized that someone besides nosy dorm officers had been listening in. Did he say there was an inmate by the perimeter of the woods? Captain Garvey did not sound pleased, and I told him to stand by as I keyed up the mic and asked Coggins if he could confirm that an inmate was outside the fence. Yeah, Coggins says, though I guess it's hard to tell through the rain. Wait, wait, no, there's three now. I don't know where they came from, but it's almost like they came through the fence to get here. I picked up the phone and told the captain that Coggins was reporting three inmates by the trees now. Make double sure before I start calling in members of the task force and the canine unit. It's raining cats out there, and they're going to be pissed if he's playing games. I was breathing heavily as I picked up the radio again. Coggins, how many individuals are out there? Coggins didn't come back for a while, but while he counted, we got more traffic on the main channel from post three. Control, be advised, I have multiple individuals coming from the fence to the edge of the woods. God damn it, I cursed, picking up the second radio and asking him to confirm. I have six individuals. Two of them are definitely inmates. One of them's wearing an old uniform. I, I haven't seen muds on an inmate outside of pictures of the training building. The, one of the others appears to be an officer, but his uniform's old, too. They're all just standing in the rain and looking at the woods. It's weird. They don't respond to me at all, but I'm, I'm not getting out in the rain to approach them, either. Muds was not a word I was familiar with, but when I asked Coggins about it the next day, he told me it was what the inmate uniforms had been called back in the 30s. They had worn a muddy brown color for about five years, but they had changed to the blues when they realized how easily it hit blood. Some inmates were stabbed in their beds and lay there all night before anyone even realized, and they hadn't been used on the compound in decades. Not till last night, at least. Coggins came back on Channel 2, saying he had nine at the moment. Four inmates, two guards, and three civilians, I guess? One of them kind of looks like Mrs. Gray, who used to teach the GED program. Can't be her, though. An inmate killed her four years ago in the classroom. On the main channel, Captain Garvey was telling all post vehicles to go to Channel 2 for the time being. After three of the four clicked over... He asked for reports on how many were out by the tree line. Coggins came back with his nine. Mobley, on post three, said he had six, with a seventh running to join them. Post one, Gumble, said he couldn't see anything through the rain, but he didn't have anything by his off-site buildings. From post four, there was no word, but that didn't mean much. Ferkel was 63 and prone to napping out there. He was just as likely to be dead to the world as dead from anything else. Ferkel, Garvey called, and after three or four loud shouts, the soft and shaky voice of Officer Ferkel came over the radio. Carful here yeah, must be having battery trouble or something. What's the problem, Captain? I imagined I could hear the Captain grinding his teeth as he told him to go to Channel 2. Not long after that, he was asking Ferkel if he could see anything on the perimeter. Nope, no one near the motor pool or the auto garage. Why, do we have intruders on the... The captain tuned his next few words into something like a robot's bowel movement before starting again. Post one, post four, go back to channel one and stay diligent. Post two, post three, stay on channel two. Gumbel and Farkle switched back. Garvey asked for updates from post two and three. It's wild, Cap, Coggins breathed. They're coming out of the fence. My eyes got big. This was getting worse by the moment. Coggins, are you reporting a breach in the perimeter fence? The thunder that rumbled in the near distance made me shiver a little. No, sir, I'm telling you that these people are just walking right through the fence. I'm looking at the fence now, and it's it's still solid. I can see the electricity arcing through it when the drops hit it, but it's still as intact as it was when the sun was up. The thunder boomed again, 
and I jumped a little at how close it had gotten. There was silence for a moment on the radio, and then Garvey asked Post 3 what he was experiencing. Yeah, that, that pretty much sums it up. They're just walking through the fence, but they always stop at the tree line. It's weird. There's over a dozen of them now. They're spreading out along the perimeter of the woods. Wait. His mic went dead for a minute, and then Garvey called his name before he came back shakily. Officer Purvis just walked past my truck. I didn't know who that was, but apparently Garvey did. Mobley, I swear to God, if you're high out there on post, I won't stop until you... I swear on my mother's grave, Captain. That was Purvis. I can't see his face, but I... I could swear that's McCann, too. The one who died in confinement before they closed off Quad 2. Garvey wasn't sure what to say to that. But Coggins had something to add, it seemed. I'd know the back of inmate Frick's head anywhere. That big dumb farm kid who got mauled by those rats. Inmate Ramsey's here, too. God, it's... It's a who's who of dead folks out here. The lightning was close now. The flash lighting up the control room as I sat listening to the byplay. This was like one of those spooky stories we sometimes listen to in the wee hours of the morning. Keller and I would pretend to be stoic about them, but I always half expected to see some shadowy figure standing at the glass when I glanced up during one of them. Everyone knew that Stragview was a weird place, from the many disappearances to the midnight visitations. But this, this was weird even for us. I kept flipping through the cameras, trying to see something to confirm what they were seeing, but I couldn't see a thing. Then, the lightning flashed close enough to the fence to light the whole world up, and I saw them. A line of people close enough to hold hands, looking into the woods as if hoping to find a way out of this place. They all had their backs to the camera, the rain beating at them as they stood, and none of them seemed to care. It was only a second or two, but I was sure I had seen both officers and inmates out there. It was crazy. What was going on? Were we under attack like we had been on New Year's? Was this some kind of protest? I looked at the clock and had to wonder who was protesting at 11.45 at night. As the lightning raged and the rain came down in buckets, both vehicles reported more and more people gathering at the tree line. At one point, they said they each had about 50 people gathered out there. Then they said it might be as many as 100. Mobley was saying they were beginning to double up on their lines, and Coggins was saying that he could see others forming up to join his line. I could see them when the lightning flashed, this collection of the damned, and when a different voice came over the radio, I felt like someone had dumped cold water on me. Captain Garvey, stand down. There's no threat. In fact, there won't be anyone beside the tree line in another eight minutes. Silence. Silence. I thought... Garvey hadn't heard him for a moment, but when he came back, he sounded distinctly ruffled. Give me a call, sir. I think I might need some clarification on this. There was nothing for a few minutes, and as they clarified or whatever, the clock struck midnight, and the biggest thunder crack I had ever heard lit up the whole compound. As I watched them there, they all turned as one towards the prison and disappeared. Poof. One minute there and gone the next. The radio lit up as both Mobley and Coggins tried to relay at the same time. I overrode them, telling them they couldn't both talk at once and asked Coggins to report first. Whether the captain was hearing this or not, I didn't know, but I suspected that he could. They're gone. They all just disappeared after that huge bolt of lightning. I don't know how, but they all just vanished. Same here, Mobley said after Coggins finished. There, there was a double row of them, and now there's nothing. I can't explain it, but, but everyone's gone. Captain Garvey came back then, but his voice sounded different. 
He sounded like he'd heard something that he didn't like. All post vehicles are to get back to their route and ignore any persons they see by the fence line after sunset. This is per the warden, so get back on your route. That was how it ended, but it wasn't the last time. I asked other shifts if they'd seen anything like it, and though a lot of them said they had no idea what I was talking about, a few of them nodded and advised me not to talk about it. It was an open secret, but they made it clear that the warden didn't like people talking about it. One of the older officers, a control room veteran with a gray bun and a very severe pair of glasses, told me she had seen it more than once while on night shift. It's best to tell whoever's working post to ignore it. Didn't it strike you as odd that post one and post four didn't see anything? Farkle's half senile, but he knows better than to see things he ought not to. Gumble, well, Gumble probably couldn't see them for the training building and the workshop, but before they were built, you could see people ringing the compound on all sides. We used to call it the Midnight Vigil, but if you get an old group in the control and post, it can go completely unremarked upon. The real mystery is why they do it. Are they spirits that are trying to escape Stragview? If they are, what's keeping them from fleeing? And what controls that barrier? What does it benefit them to keep the restless spirits inside the prison? And what things might live in the forest that would scare a ghost? I've experienced it a few times in my four years at Stragview, and I started making it a quiet part of my training when it comes to new control room staff. Don't panic and tell the post vehicles to ignore the midnight vigil. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead, Unicorn Hollow, and Army Dude for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton contributors. And thanks to O Snap, Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Grim Reaper, Tomboy Top Uwu, and Queen Sheba for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a big thanks to Scott Donahue for being our ghostly writer tier contributor. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton tier contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early at 8.30 a.m. as opposed to 8.30 p.m. My time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book anytime I write one on your doorstep in hopefully a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.